Um, hi, if we've not met before, I'm Andrew. I'm the patient and public involvement engagement lead at the Mental Health Policy Research Unit. Hasn't it been a great uh, festival today? What a, what a great research festival, some great presentations throughout the day. Hopefully you've seen throughout the day uh, just the contribution that lived experience researchers and our, our lived experience working group in particular uh, make to, you know, the, the contribution that they make to the work of the, the Mental Health Policy Research Unit. And this is just another opportunity, really, uh, to showcase uh, their, their work, their contribution. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to, to Vicky now, who's going to uh, do some interviews. Hello, my goodness, what a lot of people. <laughs> Lovely to see everyone, and what a fantastic day it's been. I'm just going to probably reiterate everything that Andrew's just said now. Oh, sorry. I was thinking that was other people. So, and I'm delighted, if a little bit overawed, to be at the front here at the end of such a hugely enjoyable and interesting day with so many contributions from so many people. And thank you, Andrew, for introducing this, ses this session. It's an honour for me, it really is, to be allowed the opportunity in a few minutes to interview several members of the PRU's Lived Experience Working Group. Sadly, however, there were going to be three members of the Lived Experience Working Group for me to interview, but our third, the third person, Kerry, has lost her voice, has no voice as of yesterday, so Kerry, I'm so sorry, I can't see you at the minute, but anyway, so obviously Kerry will not be being interviewed, and Raza has put in a plea not to be interviewed first, so I'm going to interview Becky, and, and, and then Raza, and then Rachel. Um, so I'm just going to say a few more words before... I move on to the interview. So I just wanted to say, because I think disclosure is quite an important thing in our, in our field, really, that I'm doing this from a personal position of accepting myself as someone who struggles quite often with my own emotional and mental well-being. And also, I really, really love research, and I love doing research, and I know there's quite a lot of us here this afternoon who would share that kind of self-definition. And how wonderful to be part of a session where we get to call the shots at last. Fantastic. So the Lived Experience Working Group has become known as the LUG, which is a bit of a horrible acronym, but we're kind of stuck with it. Um, and it's always had a core function of bringing views in from the user and carer-led mental health research community to the powerhouse that is academic research. And um, before we turn to the interviews, I know that Sonia did this beautifully this morning, but I would also like to draw your attention to the series of lived experience commentaries that are highlighted in the poster room here. I don't know if people kind of realise where it is, because it's kind of along this corridor and off to the left, and it's worth a visit, because there's about 12 posters, I think, and they each um, highlight, I'm sorry, also Alan featured, talked about these this morning, that highlights one or another of those lived experience commentaries, and I think their existence is a real, we, we have to thank... Um, Sonia for really having had the idea of the lived experience commentaries and they've become something that's really uh, valuable and have really had a big impact, I think. Um, so not without controversy, these briefings have become a key feature of our work and represent the results of truly co-produced ventures undertaken by members of the lived experience working group. And as you may already all know, they're published alongside the PRU's papers in a variety of academic journals. And if you hadn't had the chance to read them today, I would urge you to dig them out. And thanks to Alison Faulkner, who's hiding at the back there, I know that you can do that by looking up via Google Scholar. That's a very good tip there. And you can just find out more about them. So without further ado, I'd now like to turn to my fellow lived experience researchers and allies and ask each person in turn a few questions about what it means to inhabit this hinterland world that lies between co-produced and academic research. Hello, Becky. <laughs> so, so, hi, Becky. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So, Becky, would you just like to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, yes, yeah, so hi, everyone. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Becky Appleton. I'm a research fellow, and I work the UCL side of the Policy Research Unit. Thank you. I just was going to ask you a couple of questions, Becky. The first one of which is, what is the value that you, as an academic researcher, find that lived experience research brings? I think, to be honest, one of the main things is that as um, a mental health researcher, I think one of the reasons why I really want to do research, especially looking at mental health, is because I want to be able to make a difference, improve mental health services, um, you know, make services better, make treatments better. And I actually think there's no way of doing that without involving the people who the services are about. So I think that's one of the really key things, is making sure that you're speaking to the people who you want to help and make sure that they have input right at the beginning, so from helping decide the research priorities to narrowing down research questions and protocols. 
um, but as well as actually helping conduct the research itself. So I think it's just really important getting that value throughout the whole project. So rather than just being kind of a one-off at the beginning, perhaps having a meeting with a few people from a support group and then not speaking to them again, actually involving people throughout the life cycle of the project, right from conception all the way through to dissemination. I think that's a really valuable way of involving people with lived experience in your research project. Sorry to be speaking across you for the time being, Rachel. I just wondered also, Becky, can you think of any examples of particular pieces of work that you've either led on or been involved with where you feel like the involvement of lived experience researchers has kind of made a difference? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier for those of you who are in here for the social interventions presentation. But I think in the development of that conceptual model where we were trying to map all of these um, like 90 models onto this model, which could then show different types or sources of support, and actually having a really kind of wide range of views from our lived experience colleagues was really, really helpful in ensuring that we you know, weren't missing any type of overlap or if we weren't familiar with a certain type of service. Um, it really made sure that our um, conceptual model at the end was something which worked really, really well and that was able to distinguish between different types or sources of support. Um, and there were other kind of smaller changes that we made based on um, lived experience feedback as well. So this could be things like lightening the background colour to make sure it was easily readable, making sure that it was a clear font um, that was large enough to be accessible to people. Um, so it could just be kind of a smaller thing as well as helping to shape the overall project. Mm. Thank you. That's really, really interesting and enlightening. And I'm just going to ask you one other question, if that's okay. Um, what do you feel you've learned from working alongside lived experience researchers? Um, I think there's a few different things, really. I think some of it is to be just more aware of the language that we might use sometimes as researchers. Um, as an academic, you end up just reading lots of journal articles written by other academics, and so you don't really get to hear those other perspectives, whereas actually having people who you work with really closely and are involved in quite a large way across all of our projects, I think is actually really helpful in terms of just considering other perspectives and ways that you can make small tweaks to the language you're using, but it actually makes a big difference to service users and people who your research is about. Thank you, Becky. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I'm now going to turn the other way to talk to Raza. Hello, Raza. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Raza. I think you've had quite a journey to get here, I think, haven't you? Because you live quite I'm a long way away. still in one piece. You're yes. still in one piece, so that's always good to know. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you several questions, but slightly different from the questions I've asked Becky, if that's all right with you. Um, could you just tell us a bit about, from your point of view, Raza, what makes you a lived experience researcher rather than just a researcher? Thank you. Yeah, I think not just looking at my research uh, work, but also just my activism in general and uh, so not just a researcher. Um, I think um, this all came from a time when my life was utterly turned upside down. I was forcibly medicated. Um, I experienced, well, I was first of all traumatized by various things that were happening in life. And then the secondary traumatization, they always talk about the primary traumatization of life. And then unfortunately, many people experience a secondary traumatization within services. So that was a quite a, quite a tra traumatic um, experience, mm. which has stayed with me and uh, has kind of really had an impact that is an ongoing impact. Mm. That wasn't my only experience of services. Many other experiences were much more positive. Some really positive experiences of being in a therapeutic community and peer support as well. Um, but I think in the course of that, it, it wasn't just that I, I had my own experiences and insights on what was going on, but I was in touch with, a, if you like, a broader constituency mm. of people who had had similar experiences, mm. similar agendas, similar values. And so for that reason, I think um, I can hear the cavalry well, coming. I was just going to say, I think you're um, getting a fanfare, um, right? Um, <laughs> I think it, so I don't really just see myself as a... You know, if you like an educator, I definitely see myself as a lived experience educator. I don't just see myself as a researcher. Mm. I see myself as a lived experience researcher. And I know there are um, kind of different views on what, what exactly is the lived experience bit. You know, like mm. if you're working for an organization, it's kind of different. Mm. Um, but without the lived experience bit, I, 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 that's just very fundamental, actually. 
to how I see myself. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's really enlightening and also very courageous of you. Thank you, because that's quite exposing in a way. So thanks. And could you just say a little bit now, Raza, about how working with the PRU compares to other lived experience involvement opportunities that you've had? Well, very good tea and cakes. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess that's everyone does that these days. But no, yeah. I think um, a, a really important thing that I find very empowering mm. when I'm doing this kind of work is to have peer support, is mm. to have other researchers who can kind of inform my own thinking, who can offer, if you like, a certain degree of pastoral support as well. Mm. Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, the Mental Health Policy Research Unit has done is it, it, it's helped set up some kind of independent kind of peer support mm. that's outside the kind of remit of the research. I think that's very important mm. because if you, if you imagine just coming out of a mental health inpatient ward, mm. having been forcibly medicated, mm. um, the first thing you think is not, probably not, you know, oh, how do I influence policy to change mm. the mental health system? I think the, the jump is too, too big. What mm. needs to happen is you need to be in a circle, supportive circle, mm. that's not pushing you necessarily to do this or that or get involved in this way mm. or that way, but just a supportive circle. Mm. But from that supportive circle, mm. if it's facilitated well, you may have some people who are interested to do this or that. Mm. So uh, anyway, that's mm. at the beginning. I'm in a slightly different place now, but mm. I still very much value that peer support. Mm. Um, I also value some of the messages I get from the way the um, PRU staff interact with us are very, very positive. So one of the things that happened, which actually led to, a, you could say, a certain degree of cultural change, was mm. there was um, a, a prestigious American publication, I forget its name, the American Journal of Psychiatric Nursing or something. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. So there was quite a hefty piece of research mm. that the mm. unit had produced. Mm. And as, as per usual, we were asked to have a lived experience commentary from the perspective of the lived experience people commenting on the research. Sometimes critical friends, I guess you could mm. say. Mm. But the journal wanted to place the, um, the commentary, if you like, in the back pages. Mm. And um, the unit very much said, no, there needs to be mm. parity. It needs to be placed alongside that. So I guess on a small scale, mm. that has produced, and they agreed, they mm. agreed. But there was a very real sense that we might just pull it mm. and not put the research mm. in as well so mm. that indicates the value that the that indicated to me that mm. there is a value and a parity of esteem which was very uh made me feel yeah these guys mm. are fairly genuine of course you know they're all kinds of you yourselves are constrained in all kinds of ways mm. but yeah that was a very positive experience thank you very much Rob. i can see some heads spoken I can see some heads swelling in the audience. Oh. No, I'm teasing. No, thank you. That's really, really interesting. And I'm just wondering, because I think you've worked with quite a few other organisations as well, so have there been any sort of contrast between those experiences? <laughs> oh, there I Sorry, am. Sorry. Um, I mean, there have been some. I, yeah. OK, I can give an example. I, I don't think it'll be... Without naming, obviously. Well, I can. It's OK. I think I should. Um, some time ago, I think this was some, some years ago, mm. the Royal College of Psychiatrists in conjunction with mm. Care Services Improvement Partnership, as it was called then, mm. and Social Care Institute for Excellence commissioned an organisation called Social, uh, uh, Social Perspectives Network, not survivor-led, but involving mental health service mm. users. There were other people present that were involved in that, but I won't mention them. Um, so we were, they were working on a position paper um, uh, around recovery and mm. positioning the Royal College of Psychiatrists, which is a very prestigious organisation at the kind of forefront of, you know, uh, uh, survivor-defined recovery, if you like. And so we were the people on the ground. We did the consultations, asking mental health service users, well, you know, what does recovery mean to you? You know, um, tell us about your story. And what some of them said, in fact, quite a lot of them said, was that for, for me, recovery began when I left the mental health inpatient ward because it was a, a very disempowering experience. So you can imagine that for a, a prestigious institution like the Royal College of Psychiatrists to put that in their position paper on recovery, um, they weren't going to do that. So 
in effect, they just um, edited out, that they had the control, editorial control, you see, to edit out those kind of things. So it was, you know, it was two steps forward, one step back, maybe. Um, but, um, so that's contrast, isn't it? Yeah, that is quite a contrast, um, that is. I think that at least there was a position statement that was eventually published called A Common Purpose. Oh, is it time? Oh, thank you, Stephen, sorry. Oh, sorry I told you I wouldn't notice. Sure. <laughs> I'm very sorry, Rasa. I think that means our time is up. Oh. <laughs> is that okay? Is there yes, anything else no, you wanted to say fine. before I start talking to Rachel? Thank you. That's great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. And now, finally, I'm going to turn to Rachel. I mean to, like... My turn. I don't mean to be like that. I'm just no, it's fine. No, thank you for telling me. No, otherwise I would have talked to Ross all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have had great things to say. Bless you. So, so thank you very much, Rachel. Thank and you, you are our last contributor of the day before the closing session from Sonia and Alan. So. Um, I'd just like to ask your views on a few brief questions, and they'll be the same questions that I asked Raza, basically. So could you just say a little bit about what makes you a lived experience researcher rather than just a researcher? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a tricky one, because on some levels, it's really just about like what hat I'm wearing when I'm invited into the room, because like my lived experience goes with me wherever I go, right? So it's how much... I'm able to be a lived experience researcher really depends on who I'm working with and how much I'm how much of that experience I'm allowed to bring to the table and how much it's valued mm. and that varies mm. um, but I think because I sort of fell into the system landed with a bit of a bump just as austerity was biting really um, and that's been frankly quite radicalizing um, politically, <laughs> um, and I, I can't leave that at the door when I walk in. So for me, um, lived experience research is a commitment to political, mm. to, to bringing that politics with me as far as it's possible to do, mm. um, and kind of an analysis of power, both within the team and in terms of what we're researching, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, how, and, and kind of how that might affect the way that policy plays out in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also means that I, I kind of have a commitment to, like, recognise where my personal experience ends, mm -hmm. to not, try not to, like, step on other people's toes, you know, and, like, mm -hmm. not pretend to talk for everybody who's mm -hmm. been through the same system I have. Mm -hmm. Um, and like to try and use my experiences to open myself up to mm. hearing and acting on other people's mm. um, and kind of valuing collective lived experiences not just mine as an individual mm. Mm. Um, and like there's loads more about the kind of ethics in this stuff but um, and kind of the, the degree of accountability that I think as a lived experience researcher I feel mm. To my communities, but I, mm. I don't. I don't think we've got time for me to get into it all. Oh, you've got a few minutes. No, I. I <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go for hours. Let's let's get the next question. <laughs> Could I just ask you one other aspect of what you were just talking about, Rachel? And that is, you said about um, power dynamics within teams. I think. And yeah. Was there, did you have any particular examples? Um, you know, none of the. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Oh, sorry, um, I didn't mean to I, do that. I, not not. Not really. I think it's just something that I'm aware of, like, paying attention to. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Let's move on to the next question, then. So, as with Raza, how have you found working with the PRU compares to other lived experience involvement opportunities that you've had? Um, it, it's been better than most. Mm. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's been good. I mean, there's always, like, there's always more you can do. There's always mm. more power that can be handed over to mm. survivors. But... Mm. Um, I don't know, I've talked in some of the other sessions about points where we as a lived experience working group um, have suggested changes that have like actually quite concretely changed the direction of the paper, like mm. on the Every Mind Matters mm. work where we said actually we need to be looking at whether there are unintended consequences of these big broad brushstroke campaigns for those of us who have more severe or long-term stuff. Um, and I think that's, as well as I think being worthwhile, like I think that's actually relatively 
novel in terms of looking at, I don't think that's something that many people do when they're looking at evaluating mm. public health campaigns. So I'm mm. like quite, quite proud of that yeah, as a group. So. Um, and I think the work on the commentaries, like I know lots mm -hmm. of people have talked about them in lots of different ways and they're kind of mm -hmm. academic value and mm -hmm. their value for dissemination. But I think they, for me, they've also had quite a lot of emotional value mm. because it's hard working in research where you're using your personal experience. Mm. Like it's, it's emotionally difficult and mm. especially when the, the kind of conventions and similar things of kind of the way that academic research works and is presented mm. like it doesn't necessarily if there's things that are, are kind of don't quite sit with you, mm -hmm. then you've got space in a commentary to say that mm. alongside the paper, and that's been mm. really, really important. Mm. Um, mm. I think I worry a lot about, about accountability mm. to my community, and if, it, mm. if there's something that worries me about an intervention or... Mm. I, I need to be able to say that, and I mm. think being able to say that is, is something that we've had with the commentaries that's really important. And you've been brilliant at that. Thank you. <laughs> you've been quite a few campaigns. I don't know. I'm sure you have. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. May I ask you one last question? Go for it. Yeah? Okay, so what is your... Sorry, Ros, I ran out of time to ask you this. Um, what is your number one topic that you would like to see researched? So I feel like I've answered this question with different answers in lots of different panels, That's depending right. on, like... So we had, like, a similar one in the acute care panel okay. where I answered about acute care research. But, like, okay. my, my number one thing mm. um, is looking at suicide bereavement in survivor communities. Mm because it feels extremely neglected. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel a bit protective of it because mm -hmm. I really feel like mm -hmm. it's something that needs to be done as a survivor project. Mm -hmm. But like, um, I've had multiple instances where I've been using services with somebody, I've got to know them and then they've died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And the way that that's been responded to has varied enormously mm -hmm. from there's an investigation pending, I can't say anything about it, mm. to acknowledging what's happened. Mm. Um, and I, I, so I thought, like, is there research on this? And the only thing, like, obviously, I, I've not found everything. I'm sure there are papers out there that I've not read, but really the only thing that I found mm. um, looked at kind of suicide clusters in terms of, like, contagion. Okay. And it's like that, and suicide contagion is a, is a recognized term, like mm. th that's not necessarily the issue in itself, but mm -hmm. it felt like there, there's so much there in terms of like mm. the thought processes and the needs mm. that are going completely unmet mm. that, that are triggered when this happens. Mm. And, you know, there's research on what it's like for clinicians when their patients die. Mm. And I've no doubt that that isn't adequate and I'm sure it's not implemented the way that it needs to be, but at least there's this acknowledgement that it hurts, you know? Mm. We don't get that. And it's like, why are we the only ones who don't get to grieve this person? Mm. Um, and mm. I just think that's wrong, mm. and I think we should be looking into it. Mm. Well, thank you, Rachel, and that's a very impassioned plea at the end there, and I think, you know, justifiably yeah, and understandably so. A so little bit depressing to well. end on. No, but. Really <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's everything from our part of the session now. So, thank you. We'll hand back over to um, Sonia and Alan to close the day. Thank you. Hi. Okay, so it only remains for Alan and me to say some thank yous. First of all, this is the first in-person event we've had 
since the onset of the pandemic. We've had loads and loads of webinars to disseminate our findings, but this is the first time we have people in the room as well as online. So thank you very much indeed to those of you who've got on various forms of transport, even though the weather didn't look that great this morning. I think it's kind of become harder for people to go places for things in the last few years, and it and still is a bit. So it's really great to see so many people actually here in person. Thank you to you for getting here. Thank you to the people who've joined online as well. Hope you didn't feel kind of too left out, but yeah, it's, it's great that you've joined us too. Thank you for all the presentations, which have been excellent. Thank you for sharing experiences. So I think many quite emotionally significant experiences have been shared across the day. And thank you very much for that. Thank you to the tech team. It's been very helpful today. Um, and thank you also for all the contributions that many people have made to the Mental Health Policy Research Unit since we started operating. I think it's now six years ago. We're inviting you. It's, it's essential, actually, now that you've made it here, it's essential that you come for a drink with us or a <laughs> cup of tea. And we've also ordered a whole lot of what's described as bowl food. So please do come upstairs and find out what that is. I think that's very important. It's directly upstairs. What you could do, actually, is just if you haven't yet looked at the room with all the lived experience commentaries, what I suggest you now do is go along the corridor, have a look at those, and then straight upstairs to the social event. One final important thank you from Alan. In fact, I'm going to do two final important thank yous. Um, thank you for Andre Tomlin, Mental Elf, who's one of our partners, and has been here all day covering this event and doing great links on the X, as we now painfully call it. <laughs> First time I've said that. Uh, but thank you, Andre. <laughs> And um, I just want to say a personal thank you. Um, we, we work with fantastic researchers, and Sonia's earlier spoken about collaborations, and we go to people and ask for their assistance, and everyone sort of jumps in. But the, the core team, the people who work, our, our research fellows and others, our research assistants, absolutely fantastic. I mean, you would have seen today the quality of their presentations, quality of their research. They work speedily at great quality, and it's, it's a privilege to work with them. I learned so much. And similarly with our lived experience colleagues, absolutely fantastic stuff. And we're just learning stuff, being challenged along the way, which is a great learning place to be. So thank you for them. Thank you for a whole number of people who've been putting preparation into this event today. These things don't happen overnight. Lots of months of planning and putting things together. Tedious things like sorting out all the posters, booking people's hotels and travel arrangements and stuff like that. It, it, it's all being done by parts of members of the team, so thanks to them. And a particular big thank you for uh, Catherine Kitty Saunders, who's been um, coordinating all of this for some time, and uh, pulling lots of strings and working with the IT people and making sure everything was arranged and the food was going to be here and the coffee here and all the rest of that. So huge thank you, Kitty, and we've just got a very small gift for you. <laughs> I won't get them out because they're wet. <laughs> yeah, br brilliant work. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's it. Thanks very much. Do go and see the posters and do come and join us upstairs for bowl food and drinks. Thank you. <laughs>